So, uh, more pictures. This is uh, Enz Combi's quartet, and well, he wants to make the, the main point he wants to make is you know, there in three words plot your data. Uh, the reason being that uh, these four data sets they have the same spread along the x axis, they have so all of them have the same spread if you measure uh, the y axis, they have the same same variance along the y axis. Uh, they have the same correlation coefficient and they have the same uh, linear regression slope and intercept. Okay, so uh, uh, by these marginal and, and simple and linear association measures, uh, these four distributions are identical and uh, of course you can tell that uh, really they are not. Um, now, uh, in the past hour we've looked at uh, correlation coefficient and in doing so really we have uh, learned all that we need to discuss the Gaussian distribution. However, because association measures are important, I'm going to uh, mention a few alternatives now and uh, well at least this particular case uh, could be accounted for by one of these measures. So first I want to discuss uh, rank correlation measures or rank correlation coefficients. Two of them in fact namely the, uh, the Spearman and the Kendall uh, coefficients. The Spearman correlation coefficient is quite simply the Pearson correlation coefficient that we have just seen. However, not of the original observations, but of the ranked observations. So I'm not even going to write down the formula because it's really most easily said in words. Is there something you cannot read? It's the Pearson correlation coefficient between the individually ranked variables. So each variable separately, you simply, uh, the first one or the one that's left most, you give number one, and the second one you call number two, and the third one you call number three, and so on, uh, until you end up at the rightmost one, which has rank n, and you simply compute the Pearson correlation coefficient on these ranks. It has the advantage that it is uh, invariant under rank preserving transformations of the axis. No, so rank is uh, just the ordering. So, uh, you know, for the first, so let's say if we now want to rank the variables x, we go from left to right. This is rank number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And then for the second one, we uh, get a different ranking. This is rank one, two, three, four, five. And if you take this example, it had, it had rank number three along, or even four along x. You see it was one, two, three, four along x, but it has rank two along the other di uh, dimension. Okay, um, this is called a tie. So a tie, uh, like the thing that gentlemen put around their necks, and um, these are broken or corrected by, I think, giving all the observations the average uh, rank. So let's say there are uh, three random variables uh, that should, if they were not identical, they would have rank number 9, 10, 11, and then I think they all get the number 10. Okay, I'm not quite sure, I would have to look up uh, in the definition, but I, I think that is what's happening. So, um, sp 
So the advantage is that this is invariant under rank preserving transformations of uh, one of these uh, uh, random variables. So for example, um, if we have the following sequence of points, so they sit somewhere on this uh, implicit curve here, uh, we would get uh, a correlation coefficient, a Pearson correlation that is non-zero because uh, the Pearson somehow sees there is a, a cloud which is, uh, well, we we would get some positive uh, uh, correlation here, uh, but we would not get a correlation of one because we cannot fit uh, a straight line that matches all these points. Um, however, if we compute the Spearman correlation coefficient, we would get a uh, Spearman correlation of one. So saying that uh, one function is perfectly explained by the other. There is an alternative to the Spearman correlation coefficient. This is the Kendall tau rank coefficient. And to define it, I now have to become a bit more verbose. So uh, if we have n joint observations of two uh, random variables. We can now uh, take any pair of these observations and qualify it as follows. So a pair ij of these observations it is called uh, concordant if the ranks agree. So if xi is greater than xj and yi is greater than yj or vice versa if uh, if xi is smaller than xj and yi is also smaller than yj. Otherwise, it is called discordant namely if i if x i is greater than x j and at the same time y i is smaller than y j or x i is smaller than x j but y i is larger than y j. And uh, pairs that fall neither in the one nor in the other class, they don't have a name at all. Okay, and then uh, this Kendall's tau is defined as the number of concordant pairs minus the number of discordant pairs divided by the number of pairs. And uh, as with the other correlation coefficients, it lies between 
minus 1 and 1. And uh, also as before, uh, this is uh, just like the Spearman correlation coefficient. This is invariant under any rank preserving transformation of uh, one of the random variables. will be one. So the question is in this example here, yes, it would also be one. Because there is a, because all pairs are concordant. Yeah? So if I take any pair of X and any pair of Y, so all of them are concordant and hence we get plus one. On the other hand, you can, you know, you can, or at least that's what I did at home, uh, you can take uh, any pair of points which are anti-correlated, if they're perfectly anti-correlated, subject to you know, some kind of funny monotonous uh, transformation here, you will find uh, a minus one. Okay? So, um, all of this is, uh, let's say, uh, I think up to this point we managed to come to the 1930s or so. Um, so this is, you know, uh, established knowledge since the 1930s. And I now want to talk about uh, pretty recent development uh, that has been brought to our attention by the statisticians here in the local department, uh, namely distance covariance and distance correlation. And, uh, well, this was first published in 2007 and then another paper in 2009. So uh, I don't think this is in any textbook yet, but I think this will become textbook knowledge in the future. So uh, a very, f it seems to be a very deep result and people don't fully understand yet what are the implications. So watch this guy. Yeah? Distance correlation and distance covariance. As I said, it's an important recent result, and if you want to look it up, uh, the first paper is from Shekeli and Rizzo and Bakirov in the Annals of Statistics 2007. And the second one is a discussion paper by Shekeli and Rizzo in the Annals of Applied Statistics, 2009. So in case you haven't read a discussion paper yet, it's a funny thing. So if there's a truly important development, uh, and if authors submit this paper, or in that case here, it was even an invited paper, then that paper is sent not only to the reviewers, but is also sent to a number of discussants. And then these people, uh, you know, they go, go about the paper and say uh, the orders are to be commended for this important work. And then they uh, try and discuss, you know, related work uh, that, uh, you know, should maybe have been taken into account or offers interesting alternatives. Or they say, uh, we've, we've been doing this all along and you just have noticed. And uh, in the end, there's a so-called rejoinder where the orders politely thank all the discussants for uh, their valuable contributions and, and say, and we were right after all. Yeah? So, uh, you know, not, not this one particularly, but if you can read such discussion, discussion papers, I, I quite like them because it, it uh, you know, it, it gives you a multiplicity of views on a single subject and uh, typically the discussants are, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very eminent crowd. They, they uh, invite famous people to write those discussions and uh, I, I like them. It's, it gives you a feel for, uh, for the particular development, but also for the field as a whole. Now, uh, you are all sitting on the edges of your chair now, right? Because you are so curious after all this advertisement for how important this is. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of properties first, and then I will write, and then we'll tell you how it's computed uh, without proving any of uh, the deeper results that the, these orders have obtained. So, um, what's important? Uh, what matters is that the distance correlation. Uh, 
which these orders abbreviate with an R. Uh, that is defined for random variables x and y, which can have different dimension. And that's pretty exceptional. So it's defined for random variables of arbitrary and possibly different Uh, that might even be the first time that somebody has uh, uh, produced a uh, association measure, uh, you know, that makes sense and that is defined for entities of different dimensionality. So you can really compare apples and pears uh, with this one here. Um, and then secondly, this is not the first result along those lines, but uh, still one of the clearest, namely, uh, this correlation measure R of X and Y is zero if and only if X and Y are truly independent. Uh, am I getting complaints about the 2F? Uh, this is mathematics speak, so to say if and only if. Okay, it's a technical uh, condition here. So, uh, and this is now in contrast to everything we've seen before. Uh, before, the only statement was that if the data is multivariate normal, so if it has a Gaussian distribution, and if you have zero correlation, then the variables are independent. But now there's no mentioning of Gaussian here. Okay, so this is a really very strong result. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, it is one, uh, and then it comes somewhat technical condition, which I translate. And this is not mathematics speak now. This is very informal. Uh, let's say it becomes one at least if there is a linear relation. So if y equals a plus B X O where uh, O is any uh, orthogonal matrix. So O transpose O is the identity matrix. So in this would be any vector. I should maybe have picked a big letter here, sorry. And this is any number. So it does give us uh, this measure of linear. It becomes one if we have uh, linear association. And uh, unlike the other correlation measures, uh, this one does not scale between minus one and plus one, but between zero and one. So zero means the variables are independent. One means they're perfectly dependent. And it is hence something like an absolute correlation. So, so the meaning of this, since it goes between 0 and 1, is a bit different from uh, the other correlation measures that we've seen. Perhaps association strength would be a better word than correlation. Okay, and uh, I'm not sure how the authors found this, but here is how they justify it. Uh, they say a uh, reasonable measure of dependence is the following. Uh, remember in the previous hour we talked about this characteristic function. So I'm using these uh, characteristic functions now, and I'm saying that the characteristic function of the joint minus the product of the marginal characteristic functions that is a good measure of dependence because if the variables are truly independent then we said these are identical and hence their difference is zero 
and the more dependent they are, the larger is the absolute value of these uh, uh, of this difference. Uh, so a couple of people have studied forms like this before. What's new is that these orders weight this integral with respect to some weight function. And this weight function is associated with a stochastic process. Uh, in this particular paper, they use a Wiener process as a stochastic process. So something that's normally uh, uh, used to describe diffusion. And this is also why they call this uh, not just distance correlation, but also, I think, Brownian uh, correlation or something like that. Okay, now uh, instead of, now this is uh, the theoretical formula. Uh, since we don't have the exact PDFs in a, in a concrete case, uh, we cannot use the exact characteristic functions, but we have to use uh, estimators. We have to use empirical covariance functions. And uh, the orders now define the empirical distance covariance So we have a new squared so n means we have n samples and we now take the empirical characteristic function so there's an n here meaning it's been estimated from n samples And uh, notation here is a little bit sloppy, but I'm copying it from the paper, so you know, blame the others, because uh, we have a TS appearing here on the right-hand side, but not on the left-hand side. And this TS, is uh, those are arguments of an integral, which is used to compute this norm. And uh, the weight function, uh, you know, I'm, I'm copying it down from the paper for reference now. where the c's are funny constants. So this is half the surface of the, unis of the unit sphere with p or q dimensions. Um, and overall, this describes the spectral density of a stochastic, uh, of, a, of a diffusion process uh, in Fourier space. Okay, now more importantly, <coughs> now we come to the, you know, the actual bit that you, uh, that you do if you want to compute it. Uh, this can uh, namely be computed in a more practical manner. I'm not sure I can call it more intuitive, but uh, so that's what you would uh, do if you really want to code it now. So this same thing can be computed as follows. Mu n squared of x and y is given by one over n squared times uh, the product of matrices, which uh, I am calling S. So Sx and Sy are two matrices, and I've called them S because they are dissimilarity matrices, I think. Uh, they're called differently in the paper. And uh, so here we have a product or an element-wise multiplication uh, so uh, of these two matrices. You can s look at this as the inner product uh, of those two matrices. And the matrices themselves, they are centered distance matrices. So Sx itself. This is using just uh, the centering matrices that we discussed before. And dx is now the actual uh, Euclidean distance matrix. So the element kl 
of distance matrix dx is the Euclidean distance between observation xk and xl. <clears throat> and I've called this uh, similarity because, uh, or be because it's related to a dissimilarity. <laughs> and uh, well, dissimilarity starts with D, just like distance. So I'm looking for another letter. Uh, you will uh, see something very similar when we discuss multidimensional scaling later this semester. So, um, you know, whatever the derivation, this is a formula you can now really compute. So. Uh, dy and uh, sy are, uh, they have analogous definitions. So let's say we have two kinds of random entities, x and y. We first uh, compute this distance matrix between each observation, x and every other. We do the same for uh, y. Uh, the requirement is that uh, these uh, observations are associated. So we have n joint observations of x and y. Um, we center this matrix, so we, we, we multiply it from left and right with these centering matrices. And uh, finally, uh, you know, take the element-wise product, uh, sum over all of it, and divide it by n squared. So this is something that you can really implement in a, in a few lines. And uh, this is what uh, somebody from the Annals of Applied Statistics has also done in a picture I'm showing you here. So here you see uh, plots uh, which, and this is not accidental, look very similar to the ones that you've seen before. Uh, you also see the Pearson correlation. So by construction, they have been made so as to have very low correlations. So if we used more points, then we would get a Pearson correlation that is practically zero for all of those. So these variables are, or these distributions are uncorrelated, but by no means independent, as you can see by just looking at them, except for this very last one. And then in the bottom row, you have uh, the distance correlation, which is uh, the normalized distance uh, covariance, and taking values between 0 and 1. And you now see that we have here values which are significantly different from 0, except for the last one. So it seems to work really well. And I'm curious to see what uh, people will make of this in the next few years. Okay, so we've discussed different kinds of association measures. Do you have any questions regarding those? So we discussed uh, the Pearson covariance and correlation, which is what everybody mostly uses. And then these uh, rank versions that are uh, well, that have different properties. Uh, some people think of them as being more robust estimators, but really they estimate something a little bit differently than uh, Pearson. And then uh, finally, uh, the distance uh, covariance and correlation. I will show you the paper. So, this is where it comes in. And um, if you uh, if you use uh, the unit function there, uh, it seems that the conventional Pearson correlation comes out. So if if you use the unit function here, then R becomes just the absolute value of uh, conventional Pearson correlation. Okay, so the way it's really written there is this is just uh, a weight function in space. So uh, since we operate in Fourier space, you can uh, think of T and S being something like frequencies, even though statisticians don't think of them in those terms. Uh, 
um, they are a norm uh, with respect to this uh, weight function. Okay, so uh, so double bar means uh, yes, a norm, and you can uh, define all kinds of norms. In this case here, it's the you know bar sub w norm in the weighted L two space. Any other questions? Okay, so how does this, you know, match with the flow of the lecture? Um, it does in the sense that it does in the sense that uh, we need the multivariate normal, which we're starting to discuss now. And for that, we needed the covariance function or the covariance matrix. And these other association measures uh, I wanted to describe because uh, it is important to be able to uh, detect associations between uh, variables. And if we have time at the end of this day, uh, we will see an example of uh, how that can be done. But now um, back to, we're now heading slowly back towards classification by looking first at the multivariate normal. So multivariate is statistics speak for having multiple dimensions, normal, is statistics jargon for Gaussian distribution. So I'm starting by showing the probability density function. There are some constants which I always have to check get right. Okay, who has not seen this before? Um, and this is the probability density function of a random variable. And if a random variable has this PDF, we would say that X is distributed, so script N for normal distribution, with uh, mean mu and uh, covariance matrix sigma. And the expectation of that random variable is then mu and the covariance matrix is sigma. It has many unique properties, as you all know. Um, among those, there is the one relating to independence. So if X and Y have a jointly normal distribution, and it's important that it's really jointly normal, and not just marginally normal. Then a zero covariance also implies that uh, X and Y are independent. And secondly, a, a property that we're going to uh, exploit frequently in the future is that if X and Y have a jointly normal distribution, I'm putting this only in words now, not in formula, because the formula it becomes a little bit complicated, and we're studying later this semester. Then 
if we condition on one of these, we still get a normal distribution. Is also normal or also normally distributed. Uh, this is important in uh, Gaussian processes, Gaussian process regression. So uh, as an example, Uh, let's say I, I'm trying to plot a, uh, a bivariate example here. For instance, something like that. So in this case, mu would be 1, 1. It's centered here. And sigma, I can only estimate this now from my plot. But uh, let's say we have a greater spread along the x-axis than along the y-axis. So perhaps we have uh, variances of 2 and 1. Or let's take a bigger number here. Let's say this is a uh, variance of 4 and 1 along the x and the y-axis. And then we have some positive correlation. So uh, perhaps something like that. All right. And now this last statement meant that if we if we now condition so if i'm asking for the distribution of y if if i fix for instance uh, if i know that x equals 2 so i'm looking at this conditional distribution here and uh, i'm now making a second plot so the probability of y given x equals 2, it would have uh, its mean somewhere around there. So perhaps uh, around 1.5 or so. I could compute this number, but I don't for now. And then we have uh, some spread, which is, uh, I'm, I'm avoiding numbers now, I'm just plotting it. Okay, It's again a Gaussian distribution. So this Gaussian distribution sits on this line, it is centered here. Okay, And this is used in Gaussian process regression, which is uh, an important non-parametric uh, regression strategy <coughs> that we will study later this semester. Now, more important properties uh, the sum of normally distributed random variables is also normal. And in fact, the means and the covariance matrices add up. And secondly, uh, if you uh, take a normal random variable, and you apply a linear transformation to it, it also remains normal. So for short, I'm writing that normal remains normal under any linear transformation. And this is the basis for the Gaussian error propagation that you have uh, presumably uh, worked out in, in your labs. Okay, so where is the catch with uh, this property? Why did I insist so much on them having to be jointly normal? I want to show you two examples for that. Again, these are contrived examples just to make the point. Okay, so let's call this here property number one. And I'm now showing examples regarding this property one. So I'm giving you an example in which the variables x and y have marginally normal distribution, but not jointly normal distribution, and which still have zero correlation. But 
uh, in that case, it does not imply independence. So for example, uh, let's consider a PDF. Uh, I'm doing this purely graphically now. Uh, this one is going to be messy, so I'm plotting the summons first. So let's take a Gaussian distribution with positive correlation, and let's take a Gaussian with a, a similar covariance matrix but negative uh, correlation. And let's add these two. What I'm then getting is something that will have, uh, you know, it, it, it will have some uh, funny symmetry. I didn't have time to plot this on the computer, but it would truly be nicer. I hope you get my meaning. So this is the sum of those two. It, it looks like a, like a cross. And you can verify that uh, both X and Y in this case have marginal distribution because you know X would be the sum of two Gaussians, which is Gaussian. Y would be the sum of two Gaussians, which is also Gaussian. The correlation by symmetry here, uh, if you know these are nicely, if, if these are the same up to uh, uh, positive versus negative correlation, um, the, so the correlation of this one is also zero, but they are not jointly normal any longer. So in this case, summing it up, the modules are normal. We have zero correlation, but we do not have independence. Okay? So we have marginal normality. We have zero correlation. but no independence. And uh, the reason is that we don't have the jointly normal distribution of these two random variables. Uh, so this was the first example, and I'm going to show you a second example, namely, uh, I'm taking ga a Gaussian distribution, and I'm chopping off parts of it. Uh, this should be, this threshold should be the same distance from the vertical axis here. So I'm plotting a some Gaussian distribution here. And now these parts which would ex extend beyond these thresholds, which I can indicate in a different color, I now mirror them on the y-axis. So the part that should go here, I stitch it uh, down there. And the part that, uh, so you know, I'm, I'm ca I can draw more contour lines here. And the missing parts, I stitch on the negative part of the axis. And similarly on the other side. That, is that clear? So you know, imagine just taking a, a Gaussian chopping off everything that's outside the orange bars and mirroring those parts on the y, uh, on the mirroring them on the x-axis. And by construction, this also has uh, uh, marginally normal distribution. Um, it also has, uh, if you uh, put your threshold at an appropriate distance, you can produce this thing to have zero correlation. Uh, but it clearly also has no independence. And I know you can tweak it to have zero correlation because uh, you know, if you put these uh, thresholds at a very long distance, I would get positive correlation. If I put them to zero, I would get negative correlation. And somewhere between these two extremes, I must get a zero correlation out. So again, a contrived example just to make the point that we really need joint normality to conclude that zero correlation uh, corresponds to independent random variables. Questions? Uh, 
uh, sorry, P is the dimensionality. Uh, so it's not the same as that P. This P is the, uh, if, if the Gaussian lives in P dimensions, this is that P. All right. Any other questions? All right. <coughs> Time for a break. And after the break, we can finally, you know, put together everything that we've collected now and use that in linear and quadratic discriminant analysis.